Alright guys, Feeling here, back with more Yakuza 5, turn on. Also still watching my own Valhalla review from my other channel. Just because I decided to start re-watching some of my videos. And, yeah. Well, the main storyline wasn't nearly as strong as I would have liked. It was really everything outside of the main storyline that I end up really loving. I mean, Darby really outdid himself with this game, wrapping up storylines for previous games, bringing back the mystery that was missing from the recent entries in the series, bringing back the hidden ones into the main storyline. I love how they did that here, where at the beginning of the game, we see Sigurd return from an expedition, and we get introduced to two people who met along the way, being Dasim and Hytham two members of the hidden ones and through them they eventually teach you essentially how to be an assassin they teach you about social self they teach you about the hidden blade they teach you about leaps of faith like these were all really cool moments to see there but eventually you get introduced to the order of the ancients which i adored how they handled them in this game from a narrative perspective i'm where back in origins we knew that the order and the templars were essentially the same group but had a pretty fundamental difference but we didn't know what that difference was. It was revealed in this game that the Order essentially worships striving to be like this. I love how they utilize that distinction throughout this game. The opening arc ends with the Order of Sigurd leaving Norway for England to free King Harold's rule. And I did find it strange how King Harold never appears again in the game. I mean, it really felt like they were setting up, like, in the end of the game that we were going to go confront Harold again. I understand that he outlives the events of the game, and... They couldn't kill him off there, but I did find it strange how he's just this massive plot device earlier on in the game that doesn't appear anywhere in the end game despite us returning to normal. Yeah, overall, I'm pretty proud of this video. Um, Again, there are many arcs here that just don't add much to the overall story, outside of maybe adding a new ally that will help us later on in the story, but... Some of these pointless arcs are still pretty strong. I mean, namely the arcs that take place within the main cities of the game, in London, and Jorvik, and Winchester. I love how these I say Jorvik. I did. <laughs> no, no. There being three uh, main cities, each of those cities having three targets, which total up to nine targets. Top is Jorvik. The assassination missions themselves mirror those of AC1 as well. And because I really love this section of the game, though, By the way, way, it is fucking, uh... It's pouring outside right now, so uh, if I lose power, then fuck. I think if I lose power, you won't be hearing this anyway. So, uh, Alfred, where you learned that Folke was a spy and she gets captured, and that was a really tense scene. I really loved the conversation around the campfire with Eivor and Bassin, which was beautifully written and acted. I loved how it foreshadowed the ending of the game here with him talking about his son. But really, most of the middle section here is very episodic, and because of that, a lot of it just ends up being pretty forgettable. Well, that eventually leads us to the end game, that where from the point that we Wait, 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 what the fuck do I talk about for the second half of the video? Wait, 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 what the fuck is this video? Wait, 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 wait. I'm I don't remember anymore. from Assassin's Creed game to see these, like, robotic arms pick up these characters, and really this entire Wow, I really talk that much about it, okay. Assassin's Creed, and while I did find up on... I'm talking about the ending of Eivor's story before the halfway point in the video. <laughs> But then we get to the Bassem reveal of him being a sage of Loki, which, again, had been foreshadowed previously, and by the oh, time of the reveal, I had a pretty good sense that that was going to be the yeah, case, yeah. especially because they have the same voice yeah, actor, and so the characters so. essentially have the same faces. But this was a fun twist to the narrative. I did find the final boss battle here kind of ridiculous with him just, like, running around the arena over and over again, and to be honest, it was kind of Odyssey-like, which was not great. But I did like how we defeated Bassem with him being trapped in the gray, which does eventually lead us to the modern day, which, again, we'll eventually talk about. I want to save that for last, but, again, this is where we see the conclusion to the Eivor and Sigurd storyline, where I did like how we saw the development of Sigurd throughout the story, and we see Eivor become the leader of the Raven Clan. So up to this point, I didn't feel like Eivor had much development over the course of the narrative. It wasn't until the Hamptonshire arc where we truly see the character development of Eivor, where she gains the respect of Guthrum, and really shows how she has grown as a leader throughout the story, which I thought that was great. I did no, end no, my no, no. playthrough a bit underwhelmed with Eivor as a character, though, and I guess we might as well talk about him now. I mean, Eivor can be played as a male or female, or you can use the setting that lets the animus decide, which is the canon approach, and that is what I personally did. And I will admit, I didn't love female Eivor's voice acting. I mean, it did grow on me over time, but at the beginning of the game, I just found it so ridiculously gruff. 
Similar to Alexios from Odyssey, male Avor's voice acting is a lot stronger from what I've experienced, and maybe that's the reason why I didn't connect to Avor as much as I could have, as I obviously spent way more time with female Avor as a whole, but overall I just didn't connect to Avor nearly as much as I did with characters like Bayek or Edward, and I just didn't find Avor's arc as compelling as those two characters. I feel like a massive disopportunity comes from the end of the Order of the Ancient storyline, where Avor has the choice of whether or not to become anyone, and the fact that she just turns down the offer is really disappointing, as, again, that would have been such great development for the character, and I, I found the reason why she turns them down to be really dumb as well, where she says that she doesn't want her accomplishments to be hidden. Spoiler, I already know he doesn't die, so. Though I do suspect that DLCs might cover this topic as well, but obviously we'll have to eventually see for that. But I do feel like they just threw away the best possible outcome for Eivor's character in that one scene. But again, that's pretty much it for the main storyline. Now let's talk about the other storylines in the game, like the Asgard and Jotunheim storylines that are activated through Seer, and you have to relive the memories of Odin, but since Eivor can't comprehend DC society, we see them in relation to Norse mythology. And for the most part, I found Asgard itself to be pretty boring, both in terms of its gameplay and its narrative. I reminded me a lot of the fate of Atlantis, which was a really scarring experience for me. So having more of that just was great, but Jotunheim is a lot better. And that's when it becomes Oh no, that guy I just fought at the end of the last game. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> That's when the narrative here really got a lot more interesting for me. We do get that final cut of Odin and his comrades drinking from the moon, allowing himself to be reincarnated down the line, which obviously shows why Eivor has Odin in her head, as she is a sage of Odin, and obviously Sigurd is a sage of Tyr, and this is a whole really cool element of the story, and I did come into this game expecting Eivor to be a sage, especially because they needed a canon excuse to explain why she has a male and female version of herself, and I felt like that was the easiest way to go, and obviously they didn't actually do that, but the concept that there are being sages outside of Aita is a really interesting concept, but something else I thought was interesting about this cutscene is that it's essentially the same cutscene as the one that you get for finishing the anomalies, except for the anomalies show you the reality of the situation. Obviously the Jonheim ending is Eivor's perception of it through what she knows about Norse mythology, but the anomaly showed the true Isu version of the events and also revealed that Loki has been reincarnated as well, which again adds greater context to the massive reveal at the end of the game. Finland is also a location of this game, which is obviously somewhere in North America. For me, when I heard that North America was in the game, I knew that they had to make the Grand Temple involved. It just wouldn't make sense for them not to do so, and they did. But I will say I was kind of disappointed at how minimal it was. I mean, I thought it was cool to see Eivor get the crystal ball that appeared in oh, no, three, three. Have her to the natives, which essentially means that she's the reason why Connor eventually becomes an assassin. So that's all a really cool callback. But I was disappointed at how short the section was as a whole. And I might as well bring this up too. That this is another like kind of minor disappointment I had with the narrative. Just something I wish that they did that they didn't, and that is connecting the apple in Solomon's temple to Eivor or Basim or Hytham, as there was a pretty big opportunity here Cross to do that with the last time that we saw the apple being with Bayek, so you could have had him oh, here, and you would have led them to the so Brotherhood, which would have been out to have it in England to have Eivor find it, and then we could have had like Basim or Hytham bring it back to the Middle hey? Eastern part of the world. Again, that would have been a cool connection there, but they didn't actually do it, so... Oh, well. Actually, I completely forgot about that. Yeah, they didn't do anything with Solomon's Temple. Now, I haven't talked about the hidden one bureaus around the world, which, again, were really cool to see as they brought back more to, like, puzzle platforming sections. I really love the one more that we read through the hidden ones and the codex that we saw, which was really, really great, which details Aya talking about the tenets of the Creed, and that's really, really cool. Again, a really cool callback. But also, this is a really cool way to explain why Aminette is known to the assassins while Bayek isn't. Also, speaking of Bayek, we do a cool Easter egg once we complete all of the 
明日のイベントの契約をまとめていたのは各社長だったわけです。そのパク社長が亡くなったのをいいことに吹っかけてくる業者もいるらしい。ただでさえイベントからの一方的なキャンセルで、こっちはあたふたしてるっちゅう。し
back in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, which I, I just did my Brotherhood retrospective for a 10 year anniversary where I complained about these unfinished storylines, and now that's outdated. I mean, Juno says at the end of Brotherhood, there's one who will accompany you through the gate. She lies not within our sight, and later on, she says, It is done. The way lies before you, only she remains to be found. Awaken the six. Go alone. I mean, and this is the payoff to a storyline first concepted 10 years ago now. And now, obviously, this wasn't the plan, but Darby made it a reality. And it works. Like, it works. And I'm so happy that they were able to do that. But not just that. Like, that's just one part of this. We also add in this theory that I had, that I talked about in my Brotherhood retrospective, where I had always believed that the Subject 16 that we see in Brotherhood wasn't actually Subject 16, but it was Desmond from the future talking to his younger self through the gray. And this game pretty much confirms that. Obviously with Desmond being the reader and Layla convincing him to look further back in time for solutions, I mean, this is, again, it's really crazy that this theory that I have had, and uh, to be honest, some other members within the Assassin's community have believed in for a while, but there was no proof of it. We got it. We got this theory finally confirmed, and that's really awesome as well. And everything that they did here to wrap up Layla's storyline, along with Desmond, was just so masterfully done for an old-school fan of Assassin's Creed. And really, it's the most excited I've been for Assassin's Creed I don't care what since anything going on right I can't think yeah. of the last time the modern day in Assassin's Creed has actually mattered. And even in AC3, even though it mattered in AC3, I, I didn't like what they did there. Not necessarily because Desmond dies, but I do feel like a lot of the execution there was very rushed. It felt very unnatural. So really, we're looking back to like Brotherhood was really the last time that a modern day was this great. And for us to have that again now, 10 years later, after all the missteps that Ubisoft has made over the years, to finally have something as great as this just makes me so happy. Even that's not it. We have more. We have Basim being able to escape the gray, stealing the staff from Layla, and being rejuvenated. And again, it's revealed that this was his and Alethea's plan all along, which again, another really great reveal, again, a really great callback to Juno and Aita, where Basim has essentially been able to do what Juno couldn't. Now, obviously, they could just drop the storyline down the road and... I mean, I'm kind of expecting Ubisoft too because it's Ubisoft, but the fact that we have this very fascinating storyline here of Basim now being in the modern day, that's really cool. We also get this scene afterwards where Basim's talking to Sean and Rebecca, requesting a meeting with William Miles, that could lead to something cool, and we get the end of the modern day with us playing as Basim, now reliving the memories of Avor, which is just insane, like so surreal that we are playing as Basim in the modern day. So like, who could have predicted that coming into this game? I also kind of find it funny too how like Eivor's greatest enemy within this game obviously ends up being Basim and she thinks he's dead. But in reality, he's in the future reliving her memories and essentially spying on her life to gain information. Like it's really, really strange when you make that connection there. Now the only main thing about the modern day that I do find kind of underwhelming the fact that we have one question that has not been answered yet, and that is why is A4 buried in North America? Now, this could obviously be answered in DLCs, and I'm, to be honest, I'm kind of expecting them to. But if this is never addressed again, I do find this a massive hole in the narrative here. But still, I mean, this is a masterfully done modern day, and I really hope Ubisoft can keep it up moving forward. But they probably won't. But that's the game. I mean, that, those are most of my thoughts on Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Again, a game that I do have massive flaws with, I mean, I don't love a good chunk of its gameplay. It, it's filled with a bevy of riches. Narratively, most of the middle section of the game is pretty boring. But when it hits, it really hits. I mean, the modern day is so masterfully done here. The amount of callbacks to previous games in the series is unprecedented. The use of the hidden ones in the War of the Ancients really expands upon the series lore. In terms of the grand picture, this game brings back the love that I used to have for Assassin's Creed. It makes me think that there might still be hope for this franchise moving forward. Though with all that said, I will say that I know a lot of people have been saying that this is the best in the RPG trilogy, and this might be an unpopular opinion for myself, but despite everything,
everything this game does right, I personally do still like Origins more. I feel like Origins is, is a tighter package there. I think the story of Bayek is so much more compelling to me than the story of Eivor. Yes, the modern day is stronger in Valhalla. Yes, its connection to the previous games is much stronger. But for me, Origins is still the better overall experience for me personally. And really, if we're looking at where this game ranks in the grand scheme of things, for me, to be honest, it's, it's a, it's a I'm mean, looking back at my series rankings. I do think Brotherhood, Origins, and Black Flag are still in a tier of their own. I still think they are a tier above this game. Then we get to Revelations and Two, which I, I do think are probably better than this game as well. I think again they're both much tighter packages. They're much more fundamentally Assassin's Creed. So for me, this game does land at number six. Again, I, I still adore what this game was able to accomplish, but it's really the bloated narrative. The, Glitchiness and also some poor gameplay mechanics that do end up landing it right in the middle instead of a top tier Assassin's Creed game. Now for a future of this channel in terms of Assassin's Creed, I, I do still plan on making at least one more video on Valhalla, and that will be a video where I rank every main story arc, so stay tuned for that. I, I do also plan on playing the DLCs when they come out, and I'll probably end up making reviews for those as well. And to be honest, this game has kind of reinvigorated me to uh, want to make more Assassin's Creed videos down the line. Like a protagonist ranking, a modern day ranking, which are videos I've always wanted to make, but I feel like I have more incentive to start the process of making those videos now. I wouldn't be opposed to making a sequel video to my Assassin's Creed Origins vs. Odyssey video as well, where I add Valhalla to the mix there. But while I can't promise that any of these projects will be coming in the immediate future, they are definitely videos I would like to make sometime down the line. But for now, that's the video. Thank you for watching. Yeah, I'm very proud of that video, if I'm being honest. Like, I, I'm pretty happy of how that video played. I just it completely stopped raining. What the fuck? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm actually very proud of that video. Um, I think I did a pretty good job there. Let's do a star arc ranking, because, uh... Oh, we're in Kamarocho, sir. View where I talked about the game on a more general sense, talked about the gameplay, talked about the broad scope. Let's watch the uh, art ranking. The most important bits from it. However, I didn't get to really talk about the individual arcs within the game. So in this video, we're going to go ahead and talk about all of them by ranking them. So here I'll be ranking the 21 story okay. arcs within Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Are we at time This video will be filled with spoilers oh. for the mm. entire game. So if you don't want to get spoiled on AC Valhalla, like even the modern day, the other storylines that aren't included within an actual story arc, don't watch this video. Yeah. And before we start running through the list, we should obviously talk about what's going to be included on the list. And obviously it's going to be every arc within the game. Now, how this game is structured is that these arcs are usually tied to certain locations or regions within the map and every region within the game has its own arc associated with it there are 16 arcs within the map of england there are two within norway and then there are three special arcs from asgard Jotunheim, and vinland those are the arcs that we will be ranking here i will not be including other storylines that are within the game that aren't associated with arcs like while there are some really important storylines like the or of the ancient storyline the brief history of the hidden one storyline that involves the codex pages that won't be included here the return to asgard after Jotunheim, that won't be included here because again that is considered separate from those two individual arcs and not considered part of an arc itself we will not be including what anomalies they again have a very interesting narrative to it but aren't in an arc the modern day won't be included oh that's baba I know, that's, baba. Is young yeah. Abor. that's again a really cool narrative section but again not an arc yeah. so all of these like very important narrative sections within the game will not be included within this arc ranking because again they're not considered part of an arc as far as the game is concerned so that out of the way we do have 21 arcs to rank here and let's just get started with number 21 so for me the worst arc in the game has to be asgard also known as and for me asgard just pointless the really first tier here of the list are essentially these arcs i feel are pointless to the overall story you don't really add much to the overall story while also just not being as compelling narratively as future arcs are. And for me, the Asgard arc is quite possibly the most bored I was the entire game. I mean, there's a couple things. First off, 
obviously, you know, it doesn't have much actual impact on the main story because it is the dream sequence. Now, something I should say is that I did actually go ahead and replay the entire game Valhalla for this video. And through that, obviously, I got to re-experience these arcs. And I, really was I can't believe I did that, looking back on it. The fact that I fucking replayed fucking all of Valhalla within a week, or whatever it was. Like a week, week and a half, or whatever. I can't believe I fucking did that. I mean, the only... I can't imagine that anymore. Because <laughs> I can't even imagine how I played as many games as I did back then. Like, because, like, now, like, I still play games a lot, but, like, I only play, like, I don't know, like, 10 to 15 hours a week. Like, there was a point where I was playing, like, 30 to 40, 50 hours. Like, I don't know how the fuck I did it. Like, obviously, like, I went back to it for Valhalla, like, to get rushed through Valhalla and then play it a second time, but it's like, that, like, that used to be the norm, though. Like, two years ago, that was, like, the norm for me. Actually, no, over two years ago. Three years ago, that was the norm for me. Now, I'm number 20, another really pointless arc. I think this one is another one that's, like, usually called out for being one of the worst arcs in the game. And for me, that is Essex, also known as the Broken Hearts. And Essex is easily the most pointless storyline within the main game. Like, out of the story arcs that are within the main map itself, this one definitely has the least amount of impact on future arcs. Yeah, Burstyn could show up in future arcs. I believe he shows up in Suffix. I don't remember if he shows up in the end game, but again, yes, he could show up, but that doesn't mean it's a necessary piece of the story. I mean, it is completely pointless. I mean, it tells the story of Burstyn and his wife, like, separating and you having to stage a kidnap so that Burstyn can end up with his like childhood sweetheart and like all this stuff is just so dumb like it's a really ridiculous tone it doesn't really fit with other arcs of the game that have more serious matters at hand it just feels like a set of like ridiculous tasks that we're only doing just to build an alliance which at the end of the day for the story isn't really a necessary piece especially when the Eivor and Sigurd relationship is such an integral part of the story and this arc really has nothing to do with that I will say though that I didn't find this arc boring and that's really the main thing I can say positive about this, where in the next few arcs, I did find certain parts of them pretty boring, and for that, I did consider putting them lower on the list than this. However, I think at the end of the day, the just radical change in tone that was seen in this arc, the great unimportance that this arc has, where this arc doesn't even have, like, a main antagonist or a enemy figure, really, at all. Like, it, it's just there, and for me, that's what lands here in number 20. Now number 19 is kind of a part of this stretch of the end game where I talked about this in my spoiler review where a good chunk of the end game is really, really pointless. Because before the very end of the game, where you return to Norway, the last arc that actually relates to the Eivor Sigurd relationship is Suffix. But between those two arcs, is essentially a good like, third of the game. And we're actually on a stretch here of arcs that are within that third. The first one here, at number 19, is the Glowchester also known as a tale of wonder and fire. And again, for me, this is another one just really pointless arc, a really ridiculous arc in, in its own right as well. I mean, this arc does actually have stakes to it, at least, again, unlike the last arc, where it's like, why are we doing this? This one does at least have some positive elements to it. We do have a main antagonist, I mean, again, fine blowing, right? But we do have this, like, conspiracy that we're trying to figure out. We have Eivor being framed for a murder, and that's something to figure out who is the one behind all of it, and that is interesting to a degree. I don't necessarily like how that story is handled at that point. And for me, like, the festival section of the game is pretty boring. I was disappointed with how they dealt with the Gunner relationship here, because, like, the entire setup for this arc is that Gunner has gone to Glowchestershire to find a wife, and we go there to help him with that, and you would think that, oh, so we're going to get a lot of Gunner and Eivor relationship stuff. This is going to be great, but then, like, he disappears. That's what, like, the first 10, 15 minutes of the arc. I felt like that part of it was pretty disappointing, but overall, again, like, it actually has a point to it to a degree. Again, it doesn't really help the overarching narrative, but at least it feels like... This is another video that took me forever to edit, right? ...that the ending of this arc, at least the original ending that I got on my first playthrough, where Kainan sacrifices himself by burning himself in the Wicker Man part of that ritual and him saying farewell to his daughter and all that stuff. I, I did find that pretty heartbreaking. That's, again, another boon to this arc. At least it made me feel something. Well, the entirety of Essex just made me feel like this is just ridiculous. Snow lands here, number 19. Now, number 18, another arc that is mostly pointless, but again, had some... It's not in Hampshire, right? ...here and there, and that is Urbicshire. Oh, Urbicshire. Really? ...of Hafton. And 
が信じていたものが壊れてしまうっていうのはいはいはいはいおじさんを信じてはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいはいありがとうございましたおじさんの伝言を伝えてくれてそれじゃあちゃんとレッスンしないといけないんでハルカちゃん最後の一つ聞いてもいいかハルカちゃん最後の一つ聞いてもいいかハルカちゃん最後の一つそれに名前すら聞かなかったどうしたか俺を信用することができたのどうしてそれをお兄さんおじさんの友達だと思えたからはい、私わかるんです。キリュウさんが好きな人って、みんななんとなく似てる人が多いから。少なくとも私には、お兄さんが悪い人だとは思いませんでした。うるさく答えに合ってませんから。いや、ちょっと待って、もうちょっと。Now, number 17, Tuesday of tomorrow off, so it's like, I should have a good amount of time to get what I want done, done, so we might go another upset with this. Yeah, I think I would switch those two. Yeah. <laughs> Make him feel better about becoming the king, and he does eventually become the king. And I felt like that was a very satisfying arc within this arc.、Uh, I think it was satisfying to see Billy go from this person who isn't ready to become the king. Where are we at time wise? We're at 31, okay. We'll end in a second. Okay, I think what we'll do is we'll head down this street and pass the save point that's at the bottom of the map, and then next episode we'll continue on, obviously. I'm pretty sure the game froze there for a good chunk of time, but whatever.、Uh, Alright. Okay, we'll do one more today. I would normally end right now, but it's like I kind of just want to make more progress here. So,、uh, yeah, next episode, continue on. For now, thank you for watching.